Hello and welcome everyone. I'm just going to ask everyone to please mute yourselves. And as we wait, we'll just have a little uh, rolling presentation that would hopefully inspire you. The presentation features women that are a must know in our industry. We'll just give other folks a few minutes to join. We're a little bit early. Welcome everyone. We, uh, well, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us uh, for our panel today. We're going to be talking with Rama and Erica uh, on VC uh, with a female perspective, with her perspective. We just ran a poll. If you can please uh, fill it out so that we can understand where you're coming from, what you want to learn, uh, and your background. And if, if everyone can uh, just let us know where you're joining us from in the chat, it'd be also nice to know. Welcome from Dubai in Washington, DC. Wonderful. Saudi. Istanbul, wow. Boston. Palestine, San Francisco, wonderful, Maine. Thank you all for joining us and thank you for the interaction. Uh, just the format of what, we're, what we'll be speaking on, we'll be introducing both Rama and Erica uh, to discuss their backgrounds and uh, the VC from their perspectives. <laughs> We have a slideshow. If you can mute your sound, please. We also have a, a slides uh, that we'll both we'll start with, uh, just an overview of VC, and then we'll have a Q and A for the panel. And make sure 
uh, you let us know your questions. So we'll take your questions towards the end and ask uh, the panel. So I'll, I'll give it to Rama to introduce herself. Hello, everyone. And again, welcome. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Rama Shahaki, and I am a co-GP with Transform VC. And uh, very excited and looking forward to uh, presenting to you and hearing from you. Thank you, Rama. Uh, and Erica? Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Erica Wortham. I'm the director of the Innovation Center at George Washington University in Washington, DC. You're welcome, Erica. Welcome, Rama. We're very excited to have you both. Uh, both very inspiring leaders. So Rama, I'll start off with you, if you don't mind just giving us a uh, your slideshow on um, women in the VC tech world. Absolutely. And maybe before I start, Erica, I know that you have a special guest from your side as well. If you'd like to introduce her, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. When I have an opportunity to make some remarks, I'll kind of give an orientation of how we're situated at GW. But I'd like to call out um, my colleague, Professor Megan Lefwich, who's the Director of Women in Engineering. It's a center that supports women engineers. Um, who I believe is on the call. Um, well, yeah, maybe if you'd like to say hi. Hey, there you are. Welcome. Thank you, Erica and Rama and everybody. So I'm, uh, as of this summer, the uh, new director of the Center for Women in Engineering at GW. And just one really special thing about GW is that we are currently graduating in the low 40% of women undergrads from our engineering program, which is about twice the national average. And this is about a 10 plus year trend. So it's it's sort of a long standing. And so it's a really great place to foster women as they enter the, the tech and engineering and science world. And just from my side, uh, GW is my alma mater. I graduated from there in my undergrad in engineering and graduate in engineering and delighted to hear that there are so many more women involved in engineering and are then maybe on their entrepreneurial journey to become uh, leaders in tech. So thank you for being with us. With that, if someone can let me share my screen, please, I can go ahead and uh, start the slides. Bashar, okay, the host. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, great. Super, so uh, do this and... All right, so thank you again for joining us. I'm gonna take 10 minutes of your time to go over some VC basics, give you a little bit about the history and then tell you about today's landscape, including some challenges and opportunities. On the right side, you'll see photos of women in VC you wanna to get to know. They've inspired me and could also invest in you if you're looking for funding. So let me start by saying venture capital, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a form of private equity uh, and a type of financing that investors provide startup companies and um, smaller businesses that they believe have exponential long-term potential growth. It works like kind of Robin Hood where VCs take money from the rich and give it to the poor and not just any poor, but those with very high potential. Who are those investors? It varies from one country to another, but it typically requires an accredited investor that has a special status under the financial regula regula regulatory laws. In the US, that is a natural person who has a net worth of at least a million dollars, excluding their uh, primary residence, or has an income of at least $200,000 per year for the last two years. What do they typically invest in? Well, VCs usually look at earlier stages. They follow angel investors and friends of family who are typically giving the initial support to the founders. And they usually cover early stage series A investments, series B, some go on to series C and, and later. And so they're usually investing uh, the first time around and a few of them will reinvest in startups that are performing well in their portfolio. 
venture capital as an asset class is a very high risk, high reward um, venture. And so while VCs aim to find the very best opportunities and minimize the risk, they typically will cover the risk by investing in several startups. And one of them will provide that outlier return that will make the fund succeed overall. As a global venture capital industry, the market has reached 233.9 billion in 2022 and is expected to grow to 7.708 billion, which means that there's a, a great potential to be involved in it as a founder or as an investor. Now, how did it all start? And this is really relevant, so let's listen in. In 1949, a number of uh, gentlemen, four precisely, came together uh, to set up the American Research and Development Corporation. And they broke a mold. Traditionally, in that time, if you were seeking investment, you had to go to a family, the Whitney's, the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilt's. These group of men were the first to say, you know what, we're going to do, do things differently. We're going to raise capital from investment trusts, mutual funds, insurance companies, and universities. Fast forward to 1961, Arthur Rock moved to California and turned a $3 million investment to a $100 million return, and he invested in the likes of Apple and Intel. Like him, the Draper dynasty began with Bill Draper, who founded Draper, Gaither, and Anderson in 1958. They're believed to be one of the leading investors in Silicon Valley. And Tim Draper, who's a prolific investor, in 2009 became my second investor in a tech startup. His daughter, Jessie, is a leading investor in women. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that. Now, at the time, VCs were a cottage industry. Fast forward to today, you have VCs all around the U.S. and globally. The U.S. VCs account for 49% of global investment. VC funds in California, Massachusetts, and New York tend to um, have funds at an average size of 60 million, while others are averaging 29 million. The total assets under management of VCs reached nearly a trillion dollars by the end of 2020. One, including 222 billion of dry powder. That means that's money, cash that's sitting and waiting to be invested. 296 VC backed public listings generated $681 billion in exit value in 2021. Why am I telling you all these huge numbers? Wouldn't it be nice if women had a really big stake in this? Women-led startups, unfortunately, receive less than 3% of all VC investments. Studies have shown that female investors are far more likely to invest in female founders than their male counterparts. When surveyed as to why, one of the male investors said in 2015 in a Harvard Business Review interview that people like to invest in people who look like them. And so if you don't have anybody that looks like you at the table who's investing, then you're less likely to receive an investment. Now, this is the state of women 74 years after the birth of the industry. Only 15 women, 15% 15 of women are writing checks, 2.4% are founding partners in firms, and 79% are women of color. Furthermore, uh, a recent Harvard Business Review article cited a research of, two, of 2,000 VC-backed startups. When VCs who are predominantly male see that a female received funding from a male investor before them, then they assume that it's um, because she's competent and that she has a strong startup behind her. But if the same founder had only female investors, then people are more likely to assume that her success is due to her gender rather than her competence. This is called the attribution bias. And the authors of this um, uh, report argue that there is benefit in women raising capital from uh, less risky investors, males. 
Now, what are we missing out with all of this unfortunate news? Well, in today, uh, today, venture capital's number one investment is in AI, followed second by climate. This means that women have little to no say in how AI will be shaped and how climate challenges will be solved. Men are making 97.9% of the decisions in innovation um, and uh, on the climate. Let me contrast this with another sector. In 1849, Elizabeth Blackwell became the first woman to earn a medical degree in the United States. She was blocked from practicing in any hospital or clinic in New York City until she had to open up her own, and she was blocked by her male counterparts. Now, at this time, it was common belief that women's nerves were too high strung for them to receive an education and that women's ovaries became inflamed if they read too much. Fast forward to 1959, less than 6% of doctors were female. This is a century after Elizabeth Blackwell received her medical degree. The percentage of female doctors hovered at this low rate, and it took women fighting tirelessly for decades to reach equity in a field that benefits female patients. Fast forward to 2023, 175 years later, none of us can imagine a healthcare system without female physicians. As a matter of fact, 44% of 18 to 24 year old men and women feel more comfortable with female physicians. So what do we want to see in the venture capital world? Well, it's been 77 years since the VC sector started. Who wants to wait another 100 years for women to generate as much wealth as men? The VC industry is prime for change, and it needs women to do it. We need more women to be involved, to lead VCs, women to be investors, and then more women to be invested in. And we're in luck because today we can take advantage of programs like the diversity, equity, and inclusion, where most institutions um, that are funding VCs are requiring their VCs to invest in women and other uh, overlooked and underserved um, uh, emerging VC managers, as well as invest in startup founders. So for founders, I invite you to do your homework when you're going out and seeking investment from venture capital. Number one, search for VCs that are a good fit, um, like the Female Founders Fund. When you get on a call with VCs, set the expectations and say, I'm here to build a relationship and ask questions to qualify that VC. Ask about follow-on investments to make sure that you don't end up being not invested in because your first check came from a woman. Ask about when I succeed in my first milestone, will you reinvest? And who do I expect you to introduce me to? Will I have follow-on capital from within your network? As a potential VC, you want to get educated, connected, challenge the status quo, and get published. Learn about women like Annette, who had been on the Forbes Midas list that covers VCs for three years in a row, and herself had a lot of challenges. Listen to a lot of pod podcasts in the industry. Venture Unlocked is a great example of one, and there are several more. Join a fellowship program. We at Transform offer one and invite you to join, but there are a lot of others out there that could be a good fit for you. Connect with other women through Women in VC. It's an organization. The Bridge Conference is another organization. And there are other women for women, women platforms to help you grow as a VC. And then put your critical thinking cap on. Look for gaps and opportunities. There are plenty. This um, field is ripe for innovation. And last but not least, get published. We recently launched a platform called Impact a Billion, where we're hoping to aggregate content from others in the industry about how venture capital can become more impactful. In the end, align your ethics with your gumption. This space requires a lot of gumption, and I know you have it. And as a VC, I welcome you into it. And thank you. On to you, Erica. Thank you, Rama.
Um, so for that was wonderful. I love the 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 historical perspective. Um, so I've prepared this somewhat fuzzy slide for you all today, just to give you a sense of the diversity um, in our ecosystem at George Washington University that supports innovation. So I'll just map it out a little bit for you. Um, so I am the director of the Innovation Center, which is um, housed within the School of Engineering and funded by the School of Engineering, but we are open to the entire GW community and our community partners. One of the main things that we do is run a creative fabrication lab, otherwise known as a makerspace. Um, over here on the screen, you'll see some of our workshop series. So I like to think about how we operate like at a very fundamental level of in the innovation sort of cycle where you can come in and not really know what you're doing or where you're going, but you have the opportunity to explore interdisciplinarily. So again, we bring in folks from all over the university to be in the same space and work together and also be in touch with um, materiality, so prototyping with materials, learning how to use tools and technology, um, and kind of really support that sort of emergent way that we develop ideas. So not necessarily knowing where you're going allows you to really explore the problem domain in which you find yourselves with, you know, in an open-ended way. And we find that that's like a real key to sparking innovation is to, you know, allow for a fundamental period of experimentation and exploration. And that's kind of what we're all about. But we do build in some responsibility to, um, to our materials through sustainability. And um, we're actually a zero waste facility. Um, one of the only ones that, you know, are sort of adamant about being zero waste at the university right now. We work closely with our sustainability office to achieve that. Um, and also we have um, a, a, a large sort of buy-in to human-centered design. So I'm a human-centered designer. I am a cultural anthropologist is my uh, in my background. And so we bring that sensibility to how we define problems. And it allows us to really establish a leveling of knowledge and expertise that starts with humility, starts with asking questions and bringing people into our problem solving process um, with a knowledge that we might know a lot as technicians and as folks that are highly educated, but that doesn't necessarily mean we know the answers. So we work very collaboratively and try and set up an infrastructure to promote that kind of um, an approach to problem solving. So while we are we support problem solving, say over profit making, we are part of a broader innovation ecosystem at GW. Um, one of our main partners is the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which sits centrally within the university in the provost's office. And they have a long running, very successful program that is very structured in terms of teaching and providing mentorship for venture creation. Um, and then, of course, our women in engineering program does a lot of the shoring up and filling in the gap so that women engineers feel supported. Um, the director, Dr. Megan Lefwich, was able to share with us some very impressive numbers um, that GW has managed to build up and maintain um, over the last 10 years, which is a close to 50% graduation rate for women um, at the school. It's also represented in our faculty, not quite at those numbers, but close to. Um, and that's something that's really key to, you know, being able to promote access to these kinds of opportunities for, um, for young entrepreneurs. And I just want to circle around to some of the, some of the topics that Rama, you were, you were bringing into the conversation. Of course, you're a C's grad, a multiple C's alumna, but, um, we find, and one of the ways that we connected is that universities are a really wonderful place to begin seeding this, you know, needed approach to understanding venture capital, but also to practicing it and leveraging it. So if, you know, I, I enter this space with a little bit of skepticism, but at the same time, acknowledging that venture capital is a not so soft form of power. Um, and with more people behind it, sort of at the lever to make decisions on who and where to fund, we can really affect broad impact and change and start, you know, facilitating the building of companies that, um, 
that you know, prioritize equity, that prioritize the environment, that are willing to work with community partners and see the kind of growth that stays in line with more of the problem solving and social aspects without fully adopting, you know, the sort of kind of breakneck speed that also break th breaks things, right, that we're so familiar with from Silicon Valley. So um, I'll leave you with those comments. I'm happy to answer any questions about these intersections um, and why bringing these folks together for this conversation is important. Um, and I'll return the mic to Rama and or um, our audience. Thank you. Thank you, Rama and Erica. Uh, Rama, that was an inspiring um, slideshow and presentation and the audience truly enjoyed it. And thank you, Erica, for um, letting us know about GW's innovation uh, and entrepreneurship program. Uh, one of my questions is, we are, females are hugely underrepresented in the VC space, but as well uh, in the founder space. What uh, would advice would you guys, uh, would you give uh, to female entrepreneurs who are starting out uh, and wanting to build uh, a startup and in uh, know that they have to face um, the VC, so uh, VCs to invest in them. Any uh, recommendation, advice, um, is pitching uh, also um, advice on that? I'll hand it off to Erica first and then Rama. Sure, thank you. Um, so the first bit of advice I would have is um, don't go it alone, right? Um, is build up a group, build up a consortium, a collective approach, shore up your flank, so to speak, um, because we're not alone, right? But sometimes we need to ask for um, partnership and, and find programs in which you're supported in that way. Um, mentoring, getting a mentor that, you know, is open to supporting you is also super important. Um, that's something that we offer in a very, very different ways at the university. Um, and I think that could, is really one of the really important steps to showing up and being able to knock on the door to feel that you're bolstered by, by folks that will support you. Yeah, thank you, Erica. And I would add to that, there's a, in addition to the mentoring the incubation and acceleration programs are great. And then doing your research about the, the right VCs. So as I showed in the, the scrolling presentation at the beginning, there are many women who are leading venture capital firms and they have specific investments in different sectors. And so having a conversation with the right VCs and on top of that, having a conversation with VCs that you select prior to going to them with, I want money. It's all about relationship building. You want to be selective uh, about who's giving you money because that's a long-term relationship that you've established with them. And you want to know that your values align, your interests align, and, and that they're, they're going to be there for you for the long run. So research, second to research and getting a mentor is really have your mental and emotional state intact. It is a rough industry. They have high expectations. And unfortunately, they frown upon until now people who are humble or show fragility during a pitch session. And women tend to be more humble no matter how much they outperform men in their um, uh, skills and, and ability to put together a team and, and, and uh, all of that. So... You know, Ra'id, my <clears throat> co-GP, often likes to tell the story of how when he uh, first met me as a potential executive of one of the portfolio companies, he immediately said no, because I was too timid and, and, and soft-spoken, and that happens to be my style of management. So really come to the table with the understanding that the people on the other line are looking for a different set of skills, even if it's just to cross that barrier at the beginning. Thank you, Rama. Um, and I will op open this up to your questions, the audience questions, but just a follow up uh, for both of you. Uh, how, how would someone who is timid build up to be able to uh, be able to present uh, 
in a way that they can um, convince or with convic conviction uh, to VCs or to uh, other co-founders, um, what recommendations do you have in that for that? Erica, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I don't. Yes, I'll I'll venture an answer. Um, so I, it's it's tricky because I think you need to maintain you know a deep connection with your authentic self, if we can use that phrase, because um, ma many times, you know, the venture itself can you know arise out of a very personal passion, right? And so you need to maintain that connection while at the same time keeping it keeping sort of the bold flow of communication going. So, I mean, my first response to your question is practice, practice, practice. And a lot of incubator programs now have put a lot of emphasis on presentation style. Um, I personally think sometimes it comes across as very canned and very TED talky. Um, so I think that I'm hoping that, you know, there'll be a little more room for different styles of presentation. I feel like we can push back a little bit on that. But as you were saying, Rama, to get in the door, you need to be you need to be strong, bold, and you know, and have a very clear message. So practice, practice, practice. If you're on a team, maybe you're not the person that needs to go up front. Maybe you select someone on your team who has more of that presentation style. And I would think that's okay. I'll pass it on. Rama. Thank you. So one of the slides I showed uh, had an image of a woman and it said, women want more. This is a great book by the Boston Consulting Group. And one of the lines I learned from the book says that many industries view women as men in skirts. The VC sector is no different. Even if you come in with long hair and a little bit of makeup, they still evaluate you and we're expecting the same tone, the same aggressive presentation and presence as uh, a very excited, you know, ready to rah-rah male. Uh, we've had a lot of internal discussions about that. And then in the industry, there's also this uh, chatter about it. Uh, some VCs uh, are calling to ditch the pitch where you don't get to see the founders, but rather just evaluate them based on what's written about them. But my approach is know your audience. Before you go and present to anybody, you have a right to ask who's going to be in the room. Once you know who's going to be in the room, then research them online. Uh, learn about them and their likes and dislikes and some of what is being said about them online. A lot of this information is available. And come prepared to speak to um, that target audience without losing your authentic self, but also with Reminding yourself, when I walk into a room with children, I speak with a different tone than men, than maybe women. There is a bias in the way that we grew up and learned how to interact with each other, um, or a necessity for that matter. Um, the, the, the last thing I, I would say is, um, in addition to practicing, look at some of the pitches that have made it big go back and watch the first pitch for uber or Air, airbnb or you know the dcbc uh kind of graduating class or or the other one that i i'm, I'm faltering on the name now but um very big in silicon valley and that always likes to quote it um they always they always have the their presentations on um, youtube and it's a great example to learn from them uh, and I don't know if Raid with us is with us. He can maybe put the name of the the institution that I'm failing to remember. YC Combinator. There you go. <laughs> thank you, Rama, uh, and thank you, Raid, for uh, the reference. Um, uh, the next question is for somebody who's for a woman who's interested in in the VC field. What advice would you give them, Rama? if they want to transition, uh, how would they go about it? Uh, you mentioned the resources of um, listening to uh, VC podcasts and reading material, uh, but uh, what other, uh, and, and uh, joining programs, uh, fellowship programs, but any other advice? I think learning by doing is the best way, at least for me, is it has been the best way of, uh, of getting involved. And Fellowships give you uh, an insider insight on what's happening. 
in the VC world. So I, I highly recommend fellowships. Um, I highly recommend the networking events where you go and meet women and ask them about how they feel about the space they're in. So the Bridge Conference is a great example of that. And um, I think also asking yourself about what your goals in life are and whether this this financial equity for yourself or for the uh, the future generations of women is a priority to you. Because like all other industries, the VC industry comes with its challenges and opportunities. And on a day-to-day basis, you have to wake up at 4 a.m. feeling like I'm so excited to be doing the work that I'm doing. And if that's not the case, then you know that you, you won't enjoy being in the sector. Thank you. And this is a question. I have a question for both uh, Erica and Rama. You mentioned the uh, Rama, the attribution bias, where um, usually w- uh, female uh, founders who get uh, receive money from other female investors, uh, there's a bias towards them in the second uh, round of investing. What recommendations, or what do you? Th- how do you think we? we would be able to solve for that. I'll just open with, I think biases are um, everywhere. They're persistent and they uh, come in many different shapes, sizes, and colors. Um, what what we try and do, especially in the human centered design approach to things is to get to know them. Don't pretend they don't exist and that we can erase them or work uh, work around them, but just put them out there. And that's not to say that in a professional environment, you can open up with acknowledging biases, but, you know, sort of like doing your research, you can also include that and sort of think about what biases are going to be in the room, which ones are going to be most active, because, you know, we we deal with people, but we also deal with the broader context in which, you know, that that are, that's active when we have interactions and that's where a lot of the biases live. So if you go in knowing that they'll be there um, doing your homework to think about which ones are they and how will I, you know, want to respond or react, I think you'll be better prepared. Thank you, Erica. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I remember as, as a, um, when I was, raising funds for startups, um, at times I was heartbroken that people weren't investing in me. And I think part of the realize, the realization uh, years later is, am I connecting with them at the right level? Am I speaking the same language? And today as a VC, and you know, again, lucky to have a co-GP who um, gives me the space to work with the team on addressing these biases. Uh, and and articulating them and challenging them and allowing our male counterparts to reflect on them uh, as well as you know the female um, uh, colleagues they're so ingrained and untouched and it's like I, I brought the example of the medical field because look at how ridiculous some of the statements were back then you know that women's ovaries would would react to overreading. We have some of those same biases today, but it's so hard to see them because they are in our acceptable nomenclature today. Uh, and really the what I would invite women to do first and foremost is when something doesn't resonate, stop, acknowledge it like Erica said, and, and live with it and see why. Don't get offended, don't get defensive, but really internalize it and say, what can I do about it to change it? having conversations about it, writing about it. I was surprised that the author of this Harvard Business Review article was a woman, and I intend to reach out to her because her recommendation of, we'll go to men VCs is not the only option. The option is to bring this issue to bear and tackle it, one, by holding your VCs accountable and saying, if you're investing in me, Erica, or anyone else, are you going to bring me the follow-on ex- investment? Are you going to help me bring the follow-on investment? Um, so that would be my, my recommendation. Publish it, talk about it, and get involved in it because the stakes are too high. Us being excluded out of decision-making in AI and climate is huge. We cannot afford that. Wonderful. Thank you. I Thank see you your question, I think, in, in the chat. Yeah. So. No. 
Nadia, and I raised a lot of money. And, and if you want to ask the question in person, Nadia, please, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And if anyone else has any questions for the panel, please. Uh... Hi, Rama and everybody. Amazing, amazing, um, you know, session. Thank you so much for all your time. I was just asking a little bit, I mean, it's specific in general at the same time. So I'm a repeat entrepreneur and I was raising money because it was a semiconductor company, a lot of money back like 10 years ago all the communication and interactions and relationships, as you mentioned, were with partners, um, you know, many meetings, and then they kind of decide on the level of the fund whether they want to make um, that investment and continue it. Nowadays, it's a completely different world. And all the, you know, medium to large funds have a t an army of these analysts that go scour the web and find potential leads. And basically, their job is to check boxes which um, which I found um, kind of completely impenetrable. I mean, they're the ones that reach out to us, but it's um, like my experience has been that this is really in um, unproductive to be talking to them because they can't connect to uh, the company, the innovation, and it's all about checking boxes. So I just wanted to, um, it's very different when you have a conversation with a partner. So I just wanted to get your um, perspective on that and anybody else that has had that experience or can give advice. Thank you. I appreciate you making that comment. And, and I think that is very true of this industry as well as others that are developed. And, and I feel, A, it's, it's uh, you know, when we started working together at Aed and I, the first conversations we had and the most difficult ones were about culture. What culture do we want to have? And his insistence on curiosity uh, and my insistence on ground up, everybody gets involved in deal analysis and communication was key. Our second pillar was we are here to serve founders. We, we cannot bounce them around. We cannot you know, drag on the conversations with them. And we owe it to them to give meaningful feedback. Um, Part of what one has to do now as the industry is growing is to look for VCs that are a good fit in that respect. When someone is going to hand you over immediately or from the beginning, you're not with the right uh, people at the right level for as an experienced entrepreneur, then I would say either looking for smaller firms or, or looking for different firms that offer that hands-on or asking the the analysts to make the introduction to the partner and we we've had some of our portfolio companies do that i'd like to speak to your partner i'm an experienced founder this isn't my first rodeo and i would really like to make sure that i'm speaking with the decision makers in in this space um i know that it's a challenge going to smaller vcs that are no brand name yet but there is a risk and reward. They're also going to bend over backwards to make sure that you're uh, satisfied and make sure that they ride the journey with you and, and do the right thing for you. So uh, the positive side is you have a choice, many choices, and you have, you're in a seat of power because you, you, you have the experience. I hope that helps. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I, I did want to highlight um, the, the reason both Erica and I are talking with you today is because we went on on this roadshow under the banner Impact a Billion. We are a VC firm that believes in the impact that deep tech has and will continue to have uh, on our collective lives. And we felt like we needed to partner with research institutions with nonprofits all around the United States. We invest in the US and, and have a, a look at this space from multiple perspectives. To be able to nurture the right founders, to nurture the right community, we had to have partners in the research space, partners who thought differently. And we had to look at the entire journey of both founders and VCs. And this particular um, uh, webinar is hopefully the beginning of a lot more conversations and education segments 
uh, to support women uh, in venture capital from a founder and a, and a VC perspective. So I just wanted to shed some light on that, you know, look for more collaborations with GW on this and look for more education as well for those of you who are interested in, in um, a more structured approach to learning. Thank you, Rama. Uh, we are going to post um, a form if you're interested in uh, just following us and following our events. Uh, and we have one question from Sophia. Sophia, if you don't mind. How are you uh... doing? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sophia. Um, I am currently an included VC fellow. Um, and I am also the founder of a nonprofit for Muslim women called Muslim Women Professionals. Um, most recently, I worked on the platform side of VC, but now I'm interested in switching to the investor side. Um, and I'd love to know a little bit more about, um, especially from you, Rama, like, especially as a GP, like, what are some of the qualities that you really look for in someone who is trying to make that shift into an investor role? And what do you think makes someone successful long term? The investor side is all about relationship building, all about emotional intelligence, reading people, understanding um, what their preferences are, and looking for matches of that preference with your values as a firm and as a, as a general partner who is seeking the funding. Resilience is something we look for because it's a really long haul approach. These decisions, if someone's giving you anywhere between a million to 10 million, they're not going to make a decision overnight. They want you to build a relationship with them. Knowing how to nurture that relationship and grow it, it's not complicated, but it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it requires thoughtfulness. Um, and then research. At the end of the day, we're human beings interacting with human beings. The more you know about the person in front of you, the more equipped you are. I, I don't want to undermine the financial insights and analysis and understanding side. That's that's a given. You have to know how VCs operate and build that war chest of knowledge. And that's where the podcasts are very helpful and books like um, um, How to Invest or The Power Law or other other books out there in the industry. But I think I think the ground yourself in this is a relationship building long term exercise. I have to be in it to win it and in it for the long term. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have any other further questions? I'm hoping that uh, this was can useful for everyone. Sorry. I can ask a question if no one else Please. Does. So, so Rama, how long have you been um, as a partner at Transform VC? So I started out as uh, an advisor, then became uh, an investor, then became a general partner. Last year was my first year as a general partner at Transform. This is the second VC that I work with. The first VC, I was more of a limited partner on the deal side, um, and now it's a general partner role. And in terms of like, um, this is somewhat of a loaded question, personal satisfaction uh, coming from a founder or an operator uh, side where you're building and doing things and you see the result and then going to the venture side where most of your job is to say no, no matter how constructively, um, you know, how, how do you feel in terms of your, um, you know, your day to day and just overall, I'm I, I hope it's it's okay to ask this question. In yeah, yeah, absolutely, part. absolutely. I mean, I so we are an emerging manager, Transform VC. So we're still young and very much like a startup, but we have to do it that much faster, and we have to fly the plane as we're building it because we we have money that we're deploying, and we have existing investors that we we are nurturing relationships with as well as startups. So the excitement of building is there. Um, the, uh, and, and, and it's, it's equally gratifying to the excitement of building a startup because, you know, there are lights at the end of the tunnel, uh, whether it's seeing your portfolio grow or seeing those relationships with, with the LPs grow, um, from a timing perspective, it was challenging because today there are some bumps on the road because of the global financial, um, news 
Uh, and so a lot of limited partners who typically give us money are being more thoughtful and extending their cycles. And so there's a lot more back and forth. Differentiation, given that there are a lot of venture capital emerging managers, is more difficult. For me, it's exciting because it's allowing me the space to think deeper about how we're different, why we're different, why we exist, and how we can make a difference in both the lives of our uh, immediate community, VCs, and uh, I, I mean, limited partners and uh, uh, founders, but the larger community that we want to impact. I, I always tell that I, I spent 30 years doing things different, uh, not to end up in a typical VC. I, you know, we're building a unique VC. We care deeply about impact. We're coupling that with deep tech and we're one of very few doing it. Uh, and so every day I'm up at 4 a.m. looking for that next thing. The, the part about saying no, I've always looked at a no as an you know, opportunity to look at something better for me. And so remember when I was saying I would cry when I would get a no, I quickly transitioned that to they're telling me they're not the right fit for me. And I have an opportunity to see to look elsewhere. So um I'm, you know, we we always give founders uh, advice on we're not good for you, but here's advice on who you can go to or what you can do better. And uh, yeah, rejection is is redirection. I appreciate that, Sophia. So, yeah, I love it. And I want you to actually join me on this side. Thank you, Rama. Thank you, Nadia, for that wonderful question. I will be posting our form again. Uh, again, if anyone has any further questions for the panel, uh, we only have maybe time for one more question. And I'm just posting the form if you would like to be in touch. I wanted to mention in, in the previous slide, I, I put a quote by... Um, uh, Isaac, is it Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton. If you've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. This is a group effort. If we don't all collaborate on it, we're not going to get anywhere. I'm very excited to have uh, Yusra um, Abukwek, who's one of our interns at Transform VC. I think she's the first uh, young lady who's learning about VC from Gaza. She's in Gaza. She's, you know hopefully going to define what venture capital looks like in Gaza uh, and how it grows. And this is an invitation to all of us to collaborate because as you could have seen from the presentation, there aren't enough voices and the stakes are high and AI is moving so fast. And if we're not involved in it from the ground up, we're gonna miss out on an opportunity that is going to be as changing, if not more as the internet was um, for the next generation. So please think about that and think about how you could take part in this industry. Um, um, and if nothing, be a mouthpiece for the industry and go out and advocate for it. Thank you, Rama. And I, I think it's especially important for webinars like this, for support our communities uh, to just encourage each other. I'm sure a lot of uh, individuals uh, uh, women in the uh, talk today webinar had some insights uh, and learned from your perspective being in the VC. And I encourage you to continue to stay connected uh, to Rama and Erica. And if you have any further questions in the future, please let us know. Uh, I just dropped the form again, if you'd like to be involved in more of these webinars and events. Uh, and thank you. Yeah, thank you all for joining. Thank you all. It was wonderful to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. I feel like the host, Erica, you and I need to be the last to leave. <laughs> I can't leave